usual caveats apply. If I go too quickly, slow me down, ask questions. Um, before I start talking about the bulk of the work I want to talk about today, I do want to acknowledge that, as with all of my work, but in particular this work, it's really highly interdisciplinary. So, oh, my computer wants me to tell you that I'm in a meeting right now. Okay, um, okay. so uh, this is a selection of the people who I've worked with on these projects, the kind of uh, biggest contributors to these projects. So you can see that it's hugely multi, uh, it's hugely collaborative, it's interdisciplinary work, um, and it takes place all over the country uh, here in the US. Uh, and I just want to point out that a lot of this work was funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. If any of you are interested in marching for the uh, science community tomorrow, there's March in Eugene and all over. So uh, support science funding because it's important not just for my job, but also for <laughs> figuring things out about people's health and about how we live our lives. That's my only political part of this speech. Not really, there's one more political part. <laughs> Um, okay, so non-native speech, we know differs from native speech in a lot of ways. So it's slower, there are segmental differences, there are super segmental differences, there are differences in terms of grammar, all sorts of differences between native and non-native speech. And we also know that non-native speech is harder for native speakers to understand than native speech. And so um, we have this kind of communication problem, right? We have a non-native speaker and a native speaker communicating with each other, and the bulk of the literature, especially in speech, has focused on this non-native speaker. What can we do to make them easier to understand, and how can we help them to understand native speech better? That's a really great goal. It's a problematic goal in one way, which is uh, it ignores the role of this native speaker, right? And it puts the burden on the non-native speaker to be intelligible and to understand the native speaker without putting any burden of this communication on the native speaker as well. And this is problematic for one practical reason, which is there are more non-native speakers, for example, of English than there are native speakers of English. And so if we're going by a kind of majority rule scenario, the native speakers should be doing some of the work here, right? And so what I'm going to be interested in today is focusing a little bit of attention on the non-native speaker and what they, or on the native speaker rather, and what they can do to kind of uphold their end of this communication problem. Okay, so um, today we're gonna start off by talking about methods for examining perception of non-native speech. We're gonna do a little historical tour of this, including how we characterize non-native speech, um, which has been fascinating for me to learn more about in the past few months. We're gonna talk about factors that influence perception of non-native speech. What makes somebody better at it in the first place? Uh, for example, my husband is terrible at understanding non-native speech, like really, really terrible to the point that I don't understand how he really functions in a lot of societal interactions because he doesn't understand non-native speech. But what are the factors that make him bad at this and other people better at it? And then I'm gonna ask, can we get better at the job of adapting to non-native speech? As native listeners, we know it's hard to understand non-native speech. Can we get better at this, right? So not just focusing the learning problem on what the non-native speaker has to do, but what can we as native speakers do to improve this? Um, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about some future directions I see my, my role in this work going. So in terms of the perception of non-native speech, there's a substantial body of work that examines how people perceive non-native speech. So there are at least 30 years of research, and they've examined issues including things like linguistic properties of non-native speech that result in difficulties. So what are the kind of phonetic properties or grammatical properties of non-native speech that make it hard for native speakers to understand? They ask things about the backgrounds of the talkers and the listeners and how those impact our perception. I'll be talking a little bit more about both of those later on. They examine cognitive factors, things like uh, what sorts of properties of the human mind make non-native speech easier or harder to understand, and we'll talk more about those as well. And they, as I mentioned before, look at how listeners can improve. So um, knowing all of this, Drew McLaughlin, who's here and is one of our uh, great undergraduate students in linguistics, uh, had this idea over the summer, maybe? Summer, fall, sometime, uh, to look at historical shifts in methodology uh, in non-native speech, in understanding non-native speech. So Drew has been conducting this uh, survey of papers over four decades, from 1980s through uh, the 
songs, right? And asking how the authors portray the role of the native listener. And she's made this nice dichotomy into two sorts of camps, right? So is the native listener in the study used as a tool to examine properties of non-native speech, right? Is the native speaker just another means of assessment? Are we asking how accented a speaker is and using the native speaker as a judge of how accented the non-native speaker is, for example, right? Or are we saying how understandable is this speaker in general? and asking the native speaker in the sense that the native speaker is a, a tool for examining this, right? They are the metric. Or is it the case that the authors of the studies treat the native listener as a contributor to the communication process? So Drew did this survey and has sort of divvied things up into two pools and has come up with some, uh, these are overly general and you should ask Drew some more about uh, the specific findings, but in the 80s and 90s, we see lots of studies that use this sort of tool framework, right? And there's been a, a methodological shift uh, since around 2000 that focuses more on the listener as a contributor. Of, of course, there are cases of you know, both in any of these decades, but we see this shift. And another shift we see is in terms of terminology. So in the early 80s, you see uh, non-native speech being described as broken and distorted, right? And this is done much less frequently now. It's much less common uh, now and in the 2000s than it was in the early 80s. But there's still one terminology issue that I want to bring to everybody's attention because it's something that I think impacts how we ask these questions about non-native speech and have impacted how I talk about non-native speech. And that's using the term degradation. So non-native speech is very frequently referred to as degraded in some way. So by uh, speech researchers, listeners uh, will often, or uh, authors will often say, you know, non-native speech and other forms of speech are really hard to understand because they are degraded, meaning different than the signal in some way. But we should think as linguists about the kind of baggage that comes with the word like degradation, right? Um, especially when we think about what they're being compared to. So people will ask things like, um, is non-native speech similar to uh, environmental or source degradation? What I mean by this is speech and noise. We can all agree that speech in a noisy signal is degraded. You're not getting the clear signal, right? But that seems a little bit weirder to talk about non-native speech in that way. Uh, yeah, so environmental or source degradations, including speech and noise, or speech from individuals with speech or language disorders, like dysarthria. So again, here, what we're dealing with is speech that differs from, you know, a sort of native norm in some particular way, but talking about non-native speech in the same sentence we talk about a disorder is uh, complicated, to say the least, right? Um, and so uh, I'm not going to... Uh, make any grand conclusions here about whether or not people should be using this sort of term. Um, it is the norm in a lot of the speech research to say things like, we know speech in adverse conditions is hard to understand. And when they talk about adverse conditions, the two examples they use are speech and noise and non-native speech. So that's something to sort of keep your eye out for in the field in general, right? But what I want to ask now is a more kind of scientific question, which is, okay, so how much does non-native speech have in common with these other types of unfamiliar speech in terms of how people process them? Is it the case that we process all forms of unfamiliar speech the same way, or are there differences between how we process non-native speech and other types of unfamiliar speech? So to ask this question, I have two studies that I'm gonna show you today. One of them um, was recently published uh, last summer that looks at non-native speech and unfamiliar native dialect and dysarthric speech, and the other is work in progress that looks at non-native speech and speech and noise. Okay, so uh, the first one, we had participants listen to 78 semantically anomalous phrases. Um, semantically anomalous phrases will allow us to reduce the reliance on top-down cues, so meaning-related cues, and we can focus more in these cases on what is it about the signal that is making things easier or harder for somebody to understand. And we had three speech varieties in the study. Um, Non-native speech, which was a uh, native Spanish speaker speaking in English. We had an unfamiliar dialect, which was a native speaker of English, not a native speaker of Irish in this case, uh, but who speaks Irish English, right? 
and a dysarthric speaker. Um, and we had one male and one female speaker from each speech variety. I'll play you some examples so you can get an idea of these sorts of sentences. We'll be using them a lot for a lot of the studies I'll be talking about. Uh, but so you can also get an idea of how easy or hard these things are to understand for you personally. Okay, here's our non-native speaker. Oh no, sound was working earlier. Done with finest handle. That was done with finest handle. So these are really semantically accomplished sentences, right? Um, here is another one. Beside a sunken bat. Beside a sunken bat. Oh, I'll turn it up, yeah. This button requires like eight presses to go up one click. Okay, uh, so I'll play that one again. Beside a sunken bat. Beside a sunken bat. That's the Irish English speaker. When I played these for my husband before a talk I gave last summer, uh, he thought that one said soy sock butt. <laughs> uh, proves that he is not awesome at this task. Uh, and here's our dysarthric speaker. Stable wrist and load it. Stable wrist and load it. Okay. And they have these particular rhythmic properties, which I'll get to in a couple of experiments. So. Um, we had 50 participants listen to the fully randomized set of these phrases. So they heard a bunch of phrases from each of these six speakers. And then they completed some non-speech tasks as well, including a demographic questionnaire, the Peabody picture vocabulary test, which gives us an idea of receptive vocabulary of these speakers. This test also happens to be really strongly correlated with verbal IQ. So one way of thinking about this test is measuring something about how people are at language in general. Are they good languagey people, right? Um, and then we had two cognitive tasks, which I'll explain on the next slide. The first was a flexibility measure that uh, was designed to have people essentially, this is kind of like the card sorting tasks you see sometimes, where you have to learn a rule, so you have to sh sort first maybe by color and then by shape, something like that. It's not quite the same, but you can think of it in this way. And the idea is, when the rule changes, how long does it take you to learn that rule, right? This is a way of getting at flexibility in the cognitive system. How quickly do you learn a new rule, right? And if you're really flexible, maybe you're better at understanding some of these types of unfamiliar speech. We also used an inhibition measure. This was the flanker task. In the neutral case, we had a little chevron that was pointing in one direction. The participant just had to say left or right. In the congruent condition, it's presented with a bunch of other arrows that are all pointing in the same direction. In the critical condition is when the other arrows are pointing in the opposite direction. Can you inhibit that information and pay attention to the arrows instead? Um, I will give you a little bit of a spoiler, which is it doesn't really matter if you understand these things because none of them ended up influencing our results. <laughs> uh, so in case anyone's concerned before we move on. What I'm going to show you on the next slide is correlations among each of the individual speech types. So what we see is that perception of non-native speech correlates strongly with the unfamiliar dialect, with perception of the unfamiliar dialect. Meaning if you're good at understanding non-native speech, you're good at understanding the unfamiliar dialect. The same thing is actually true for the dysarthric speech and the non-native speech, but we see no correlation between the dysarthric speech and the unfamiliar dialect. I'll let you guys stew on that for a second. I'm going to come back to what it means, but I want to show you the last bit of results. As I mentioned before, the up two cognitive tasks are not significant predictors of performance, but the Peabody Picture Vocabulary task is a significant predictor of performance in all of these cases. So you see a nice correlation here. And I should say that this is kind of surprising because all of our participants are college students who have pretty big vocabularies as far as uh, the general population goes. And so we're seeing a range, even among our college speakers, in terms of how well the vocabulary and maybe something like verbal IQ predict their performance on this task. So to summarize these results, we see a wide, very, I didn't point this out before, but um, there's a lot of range here in terms of how good people are at this task. Some people are great at it. Some people are really not great at it. So we're seeing a wide range of individual variability in performance. And we saw that performance uh, on dysarthric speech and non-native speech correlates, as does performance on an unfamiliar dialect and non-native speech. But performance in, on dysarthric speech and unfamiliar dialect does not correlate. And so um, we wanted to think about why that might be. What are some of the properties that might be similar or different across these types of speech? 
So why does perception of uh, dysarthric speech not correlate with the unfamiliar dialect? This is a little bit surprising because they're both native speakers, right? So they should have some similarities. Um, but we thought that maybe the talker-related deviation in the signal is actually too dissimilar to utilize similar mechanisms. Uh, the dialect and uh, the unfamiliar dialect and non-native speech might have systematic vowel differences in common. And so you're, if you're good at getting systematic vowel differences and understanding those, maybe you can use that skill for both of those two things, right? Um, it's possible that non-native speech and dysarthric speech may share some sort of rhythmic irregularity or segmental inconsistency, that there might be something unpredictable about those two types of speech uh, or not talk more about that in a second. Um, so what we see here is the critical thing, I think, is that linguistic knowledge appears to be critical in perception of unfamiliar speech, broadly speaking. So that's the thing that sort of holds these three things together. And individual differences are caused by a number of different factors in this case, um, some of which I think will be interesting to look at when we unpack what's really in the signal, which we haven't been able to do very closely yet. And we have some ideas about how to do that in a few slides. Okay, um, so uh, this leads us to our next question, which is uh, the two kinds of speech that are often compared as being degraded in some way are non-native speech and speech in noise. So what is similar or different about these types of speech? Uh, so this is uh, Drew's honors thesis that I'm gonna show you a little bit of. It's preliminary data, so you know, if we're telling a different story in a month, uh, we haven't finished all the analysis yet. So we had 80 of these anomalous sentences in four conditions. The first was native speech in an energetic masker. The masker just means the noise that's played on top of this. This is speech-shaped noise, which means it's taken from the same frequencies as speech. It sounds like shh, I'll play some of it for you. At a negative 2 dB uh, SNR, which means the noise is slightly louder than the signal. Here's an example. No. Okay, that was fun. Listen to final station. I'll play it again. Listen to final station. Listen final station. Yeah, you guys get better at this over time, right? The, the particular types of uh, sentences. We have a native speaker and informational masking. Informational masking means that you have another speaker in the background who is saying also semantically anomalous sentences <laughs> at a louder volume than the signal that you're listening for. So this is really hard. It's slightly easier in this example because I don't have the actual files. These were kind of mixed online during the experiment. So I tried to do this in my office this afternoon. And uh, fortunately for all of you, the masker sounds like uh, the chipmunks. It's really high pitched. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't know why, but uh, imagine another male talker uh, with a similar kind of pitch range talking in the background. That's, I don't know why they're not playing the first time. Okay, wait. Yeah. How do speak? How do your subjects know which one they're supposed to be paying yeah, attention to? Yeah, so we tell to? them explicitly to pay attention to the second person who comes on. The first one comes on half a second early, okay. and then the second person comes on after that. Uh, yeah, and they get pretty good at it. Uh, surprisingly, I feel like nobody would ever be able to do this task, but people get pretty good at. And the voices sound different enough that you know who you're listening for. And that person shows up as a speaker in other conditions, including the energetic masking case. So you know the speaker that you're going for. OK, uh, the non-native speech was in quiet. This, again, was a native uh, Spanish speaker speaking English. Here's an example of that. Butcher in the middle. Butcher in the middle. It feels so easy after those other ones, right? <laughs> um, and here is the non-native speech and energetic masker. So this is similar to this native speaker and energetic mm -hmm. masking, right? So it's just noise, but it's the non-native speaker as well. So we're combining these two in one condition. You'll notice that our uh, signal to noise ratio is a little bit easier. That's because this is really, really hard and people were having trouble with this particular task. So here's an example. Connect the beer device. Connect the beer device. And the noise was selected randomly on each trial, so we know it's not something about the properties of the noise, it's taken randomly on each trial. Okay. 
Um, so participants, again, listened to a fully randomized set of phrases. They typed their response. And this time, they did a bunch of other stuff. This was a very in-depth experiment for our participants. They did the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test again. They did the color stroop test. So this is where you have a word printed in a color, and it either matches or mismatches what the color that is spelled out is. You either have blue printed in red or blue printed in blue. And you see how fast people are at blue printed in blue. Those of you who have taken a class with me have seen this, right, in class. OK, um, the musical ear test is a test of rhythm perception. Basically, participants hear wooden block uh, rhythms tapped out on a wooden block. And they're supposed to say, is it the same rhythm or a different rhythm? Um, we also used the word auditory recognition and recall measure, which is an auditory working memory task. Uh, basically, we're seeing how strong people's memory abilities are, because that might matter here. And then we do a machine learning audiogram, a hearing test just done on the computer. It's a really cool hearing test if anybody wants to use it. Uh, it's awesome, because it's free. That's the number <laughs> one reason why. Um, and our, as I mentioned before, our data analysis is still in progress. So to talk you through the first part of the results, we're going to look at what correlates among these different types of speech. Um, and to do that, we made a little schematic. We, Drew, made a little schematic uh, that shows uh, the speaker here and then the, the listening environment on the x-axis. And what you see is that we have the native in energetic and informational masking, the non-native speaker in energetic, and the non-native speaker in quiet. We didn't have the native speaker in quiet because that would make the task way too easy and everybody would be at ceiling. So we know they'd be at basically 100%. We don't have the non-native speaker in informational masking because it would be way too hard and everybody would be at the floor, right? So we have these cases where we think there's some room for variability. And what we see is that if you look at correlations, native uh, speakers and energetic masking and non-native speakers and energetic masking performance on those two tasks um, correlates, which is nice because it suggests something about your ability to understand speech and noise is intact regardless of who that speaker is, right? We also see that performance in terms of uh, the native speaker in energetic masking and the native speaker in informational masking correlates, which is also nice because it's maybe something about speech and noise in general that's sort of helping you out there, right? And we see that non-native speech, speak, speech in quiet and non-native speech in energetic masking also correlate. And these correlations are all quite strong. We also see this uh, correlation between the native speaker and informational masking and the non-native speaker and quiet. That correlation is a bit weaker, and so um, we're not quite sure why that one is emerging. I think Drew has some ideas about it, but um, that one is sort of less interesting to us than these other stronger correlations where we see performance really being similar when it's along the same kind of class of speech, right? When it's non-native speech or when it's native speech or when it's both in noise, things like that. If we look at performance on these um, cognitive measures, we see again that vocabulary predicts performance in everything. If you're good at language, you're good at this language you task. It's not super interesting, but it is in some sense nice to see that there's some kind of validity to this measure. Uh, interestingly, the rhythm test uh, predicts performance in native informational masking and native energetic masking. So there's something about your ability to unpack speech from noise that uh, rhythm perception helps with. And this might be, and we'll think more about this when we start talking about variability in a second, it might be the case that the rhythm information is more predictable in native speech, and so you're able to use rhythm information more meaningfully right, in native speech than in non-native speech. We see this working memory measure um, influence performance in every condition except for the native speaker and energetic masking. Uh, we think there are some possible reasons for that. Uh, our current hypothesis, tell me if I'm wrong about this, Drew, is that uh, it might be correlating in these two cases for a different reason than it correlates in this case, um, that native speech in informational masking um, might tax your working memory in a different way than the non-native speech in uh, quiet and in energetic masking, but both of them, working memory helps in both cases. Um, the Stroop task, the selective attention task, uh, didn't correlate at all which is sort of interesting because it has been shown to influence perception of speech and noise under some other conditions. There are some reasons why it might not emerge here. And then, uh, interestingly, uh, the hearing test, this is really preliminary because I just re-ran these correlations today. Uh, it looks like it 
correlates with perception of energetic masking, speech and energetic masking. So your ability to just hear in general influences your ability to hear a signal when it's in pure noise, not speech in noise, right? And this is sort of interesting. I will take a quick moment to take a, a kind of side path, which is my audiologist friends tell me that the number one complaint for people who are losing their hearing is that they have a hard time hearing in crowded rooms, right? And they complain that their hearing aid isn't helping them in crowded rooms. Well, this sort of makes sense if we don't see hearing ability influence informational maskings. So crowded rooms has all of this information around you and your job is to tune out that information, right? And if hearing isn't helping that, that might explain some of the reason why uh, people with hearing aids get really frustrated that they aren't working in these crowded environments. Okay. So what we can take from this study is that intelligibility scores across listening challenges of the same kind of class, either environmental challenges or talker-related challenges, significantly correlate with one another. And correlations of intelligibility scores across classes of listening challenges are weaker. Vocabulary and working memory correlate with a bunch of things which might be interesting, uh, but right now we're thinking about why rhythm perception only correlates with environmental degradations of a particular type. And all of this is to say that listeners may recruit different resources when faced with different types of challenges. So what this suggests to me is that listeners are recruiting different sorts of skills when they're listening to different kinds of speech. That's not rocket science, right? But it is sort of interesting that we don't see non-native speech and speech and noise behaving in identical ways because it's treated that way in a lot of the literature. Okay, so uh, we're gonna take a quick foray away from um, non-native speech for a second to think about a type of strategy that might differ across different types of listening challenges. So uh, this is a paper we have under review um, that looks at the idea of a metrical segmentation strategy. So some previous work has suggested that especially in English, listeners use a metrical segmentation strategy in which they assume that when they misunderstand something, strong syllables are word initial, so if they're going to make a word boundary, it's going to be right before the strong syllable. And so the metrical segmentation strategy means mistakenly inserting or deleting a word boundary to reflect stress, stress initial segmentation. Um, here are some examples of that. Um, these sentences might look familiar because they are of the class that we've been using in all of these previous studies, right, with this interesting strong, weak, strong, weak rhythm, or weak, strong, weak, strong. So we have unseen machines agree. If you say, I see machines agree, that's inserting a boundary before a strong syllable. Right? If you have push her equal culture, and instead you say picture equal culture, you're deleting a word boundary before a weak syllable. Right? Does that basically make sense to everybody? Music useful rising, music used for rising, you're inserting before a weak syllable, and then define respect instead, define respect he said, you're deleting uh, before a strong syllable. Um, that, those two bottom ones should be switched, sorry. Um, and if a listener is adhering to the metrical segmentation strategy, we should see more of these top two than uh, the bottom errors. So in order to look at this, we had participants transcribe anomalous sentences again, this time speech and noise and a dysarthric speaker, recoded not only for words correct, but also for the use of metrical segmentation strategy. What kinds of errors did people make? So the top plot is gonna be a box plot. You're gonna see uh, the dysarthric speech on the right in blue and the speech and noise in purple on the left. And the nice thing about this data is that they're about equally accurate in terms of their ability to understand the speech and noise and the dysarthric speech, our participants. But we see a big difference when we look at how they use the metrical segmentation ratio. So they are more likely to use it, it's higher up here in the case of speech and noise than it is in the case of dysarthric speech. Okay, and the second question here is, if you're good at one, are you good at the other? And if you use metrical segmentation strategy, do you use it in the other case as well? The answer for both of these is yes, this is the intelligibility data. How well did you understand this speech? There's a nice positive correlation. If you understand speech and noise, you're more likely to understand dysarthric speech. Uh, and if you are a person who uses MSS strategy a lot, you're more likely to use it regardless of the case. Um, these results suggest that uh, you use MSS when rhythm information is more predictable. 
So I haven't told you much about dysarthric speech, but it's a speech motor disorder that results in, uh, maybe you can do a better job than I can, Jill, explaining what it is, but it results in typically unpredictable sorts of articulation patterns for the speaker. Is that roughly accurate? Yeah, there's a lot of different types. Yeah, 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 and I didn't get into that either. The dysarthric speakers in the first case are ataxic dysarthric speakers, and in this case, they're spastic, but it's similar sort of idea in that the production is um, more variable in terms of their ability to produce in a kind of consistent rhythm. Whereas in speech and noise, the rhythmic properties are maintained, right? They're the same, regardless of whether you have the speech and noise or not. And so people are using rhythm information when rhythm information is reliable and not using it when it's less reliable. Um, and interestingly, individuals who rely more on the MSS metrical segmentation strategy do so in both speech and noise and in dysarthric speech. So our current work is to look at how non-native speech fits in here, which leads to the question of, is rhythm information in fact uh, more consistent in native speech than in non-native speech? So I'm gonna take a little foray into production, non-native production, but not for the purposes of figuring out how we can make non-native productions better, instead to figure out what are the properties of non-native speech that native speakers can get better at, right? Better at understanding. So, uh, non-native speech is often considered to be less predictable or more variable than native speech, but there's a bunch of evidence that this situation is much more complicated than that. The tagline for basically all of my research in my lab should be, it's complicated, um, <laughs> because it really is complicated. Uh, so the first question we asked about this was, are non-native speakers more variable in speaking rate in addition to being slower overall? So in terms of how quickly or slowly they speak across utterances, are they more variable than native speakers? So on the next slide, there's gonna be box plots and I wanna explain them before I show them just so you have an idea of what you're looking at. On the y-axis, you're gonna see rate change. Higher means people are changing things more often, yeah? You're gonna see three boxes, yeah, three boxes, green, yellow, and purple. The yellow and purple on the outside, those are non-native speakers, Mandarin speakers and Korean speakers. Um, and the green box in the middle is native English speakers, okay? Uh, what we're interested in is how big the boxes are. Bigger box means more variability, littler box means less variability, more consistency, okay? So uh, what we see here for red speech, these are people reading passages, we see that the non-native speakers are more variable than the native speakers. Hooray, we found that non-native speakers are more variable than native speakers, so let's go write a paper about it. So we did, and then we looked at the same speakers speaking spontaneously, okay? So we have these exact same speakers doing these spontaneous question and answer tasks, telling stories, and the pattern is reversed. So native speakers are more variable than non-native speakers when they're speaking spontaneously, and if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense, right? We use speaking rate to be informative as native speakers. I can create drama by slowing something down and then can speed over something I'm not that interested in, right? I can do that with my speaking rate. And that variability is not a sign of not knowing the language. That variability is a sign of mastery of the language, right? So already we have, it's complicated. Just wait guys, it gets better. <laughs> okay. Um, so in another paper, we examined um, a bunch of red passages from non-native speech. So we are looking at red passages here again. And what we were interested in is what are some cases that non-native speech might be predict, uh, that uh, variability rather might be predictable. And one case variability is super predictable in native English speech is content versus function words. If you are a native speaker of English, you are really good at making content words really short and tiny, right? So it turns out, unsurprisingly, non-native speakers do not make much of a duration difference between content and function words. We have Chinese and Korean speakers here. Native English speakers make a huge difference in the word duration. So this is a form of variability, right? And nobody would claim this variability has something to do with lack of mastery of the language. So in some cases, where variability is actually important, non-natives are less variable. So uh, in that paper, we wanted to ask, what are some other cases where we might expect variability to be meaningful? We know that high-frequency words tend to be shorter than low-frequency words. 
Is this also the case for non-native speakers? Two answers here. One is, yes, non-native speakers do make a difference in terms of word frequency. All of these lines slant down, those are significant correlations. But they don't make as big a difference as the native speakers do. So native speakers are using this kind of variability really meaningfully and importantly, and non-native speakers aren't doing it as much. So uh, this all uh, kind of came uh, at the same time as some work that I've been doing with Charlotte and Kaori looking at what makes non-native speech hard to understand. And as we've been talking about a lot here, it deviates from native speech, right? Uh, there was a paper in 2007 that investigated variability in vowel spectra. And before uh, these two papers I talked about before, this is basically the only one of the only papers to actually look at this. And they found that for their non-native speakers, they were more variable in their vowel spectra than native speakers as measured by standard deviation. So these were learners of English, native Spanish speakers. What the field did with this is went wild and decided to write in dozens of papers, non-native speech is less consistent than native speech on the basis of one paper looking at one language pairing. So we decided to take a really simple approach to this, right, and ask, okay, so we see that for vowel spectra for Spanish and English. What about another language pair? <laughs> as a place to start to make a generalization, right? So what I'm going to be showing here is bar graphs of vowels in Japanese. We have native English speakers, native Mandarin speakers learning Japanese. So there will be dark blue bars on the far right. Those are native Japanese speakers. Green and yellow are the native English and native Mandarin speakers. What we're interested in is are the blue bars always shorter than the green and yellow bars? Yeah? Um, no, is the answer. <laughs> You're having trouble unpacking this. This bar is higher, this bar is higher, this bar is higher, this bar is higher, etc. right? And in cases where it is not higher, it's like pretty similar to at least one of the non-native speaking groups. So uh, traditionally, it's been assumed and stated that vowel variability in non-native speakers is caused by a lack of articulatory control. Non-native speakers are variable because they don't know what they're trying to produce. Our results suggest that increased variability might be due to the specific L1, L2 pairing, right? So what we see in the weighted all results is that you're wrap mapping a relatively sparse vowel space to a relatively crowded vowel space in English, right? And for our Mandarin and English speakers, you're doing the reverse. You're taking a relatively crowded vowel space and mapping it onto a relatively sparse five vowel system. So to me, it makes sense that a native English speaker is going to be pretty consistent about where they place their E, right? Regardless of whether that's in English or in Japanese. Because they know that in English, if they wiggle around with that E too much, they're going to bump into I, they're going to bump into A, they're going to bump into E, right? So they can't be as varied. Um, okay, so what we've seen for these cases is that non-native speech is not uniformly more variable than native speech. And we should stop writing papers that say that. I just reviewed another one like two days ago that said it, and I was like, nope, see this paper. Uh, okay, and different types of variability might manifest themselves differently, right? So it's important to understand the qualities of non-native speech, including variability, to understand how listeners understand this speech and adapt to it. So I'm going to take the last 15-ish minutes to talk about adaptation to non-native speech. And uh, we're going to take two approaches to this. So one is we know that many types of listening challenges improve with practice. And we want to know whether listeners can improve at understanding non-native speech as well. Um, so the first kind of way we're going to look at adapting to non-native speech is a very gross approach, right? So instead of saying, can this happen in the lab, we're going to say, are there people who through a lot of practice get better at understanding non-native speech. So this is some work that um, Beth Shepard and Nancy Elliott at AEI uh, led the charge on, and I was happy to come along for the ride on this. Uh, we asked uh, whether ESL instructors and content faculty at this very university understand non-native speech differently. Okay, and we're focusing on intelligibility and comprehensibility. So for comprehensibility, we have this nine-point Likert scale. We just ask, how easy is it to understand this speech? On a scale of one to nine. Nine is I can understand it with no effort. One is it's really hard to understand. 
Yeah? Intelligibility, people are asked to just transcribe the speech. These are kind of semi-spontaneous uh, productions that AI students recorded at their last day of IEP, is that right? Yeah, last day of IEP. So these are like getting ready to enter the university, right? And in addition to this, we asked a few questions about listeners' attitudes and experiences. So do you have a lot of experience with non-native speech, yes or no? And we coded this for both the ESL and the content faculty, just high versus low, this sort of uh, median split idea. And then we coded attitude only for the content faculty because uh, the AI instructors were really mostly nice about the non-native speech. Uh, <laughs> the uh, content faculty, a little bit less so. They had some feelings about international <laughs> students in their classrooms. So we have positive, neutral, and negative uh, attitudes. So I'm gonna show first to the intelligibility scores. These are divided up by speaker, and they're divided up by speaker for a reason, which you'll see on the next slide. The lighter bars are ESL instructors, darker bars are content faculty, higher means understanding people better. Overall, people, I'm sorry these lighter bars just are not showing up at all, but you can guess where they are based on the lighter <laughs> bars. Um, okay, that's hilarious. See, this is my lesson, guys, when I talk about how to present data, don't make them in gray bars that won't show up. Um, okay, so uh, what we see in general is that there's not a huge difference between where these kind of error bars fall except for these three lowest proficiency individuals, where you do see a sort of difference in terms of the ESL instructors being better able to understand the lower proficiency speakers. We see no evidence of attitude impacting uh, intelligibility scores, okay? In terms of comprehensibility, across the two groups, broadly speaking, there aren't really significant differences between ESL instructors and content faculty. What is fascinating and my favorite part of this entire study is that experience matters here. If you have more experience, it doesn't make the speech actually easier to understand, but you feel like it's easier to understand. <laughs> okay, so you're equally good at transcribing it, but you feel like it was hard. And attitude matters a lot. If you have a bad attitude about non-native speakers, you feel like this task was way harder than if you have a positive attitude. It doesn't actually impact your ability to understand their speech in terms of writing the words down. Yeah. Did you measure how long it took? Like, no, could so it have we been didn't harder? do that. It could have actually been harder, right? So it could be the case, that, and we do know there are some downstream effects for understanding non-native speech. So listening effort is a new kind of hot topic in this field. Kristen Van Engen at Washington University um, and Jonathan Keel are doing work on this. Um, and I'm working with them on some of these things, but we do see that memory for certain things is reduced if you're putting more effort forth in general. That's true for speech and noise, that's true for anything we can do to make the listening task harder. So it could actually be that it was harder for them, but the result was the same. It's a little bit like whiny about this, right? They're like, oh, it was so hard for me to understand this. Well, you did just fine, so. <laughs> um, okay, so intelligibility, especially of lower proficiency speakers, is influenced by ESL versus content faculty, right? So for lower proficiency speakers, we do see that experience matters. Um, comprehensibility is influenced more by experience than by attitude, or, uh, no. It's in, comprehensibility is influenced more by experience and attitude than intelligibility is. And in a follow-up study, we asked whether we could identify properties in speech that correlated with either intelligibility or comprehensibility or fluency. So this is a, a little manuscript that's gonna be coming out in the Ortiz Cell Journal this spring. Uh, we asked people to uh, provide careful ratings, expert raters to provide careful ratings on a number of factors. Um, vowel pronunciation, consonant pronunciation, stress, rhythm, intonation, grammatical accuracy, lexical accuracy, etc. And in the previous study, instructors were also asked to rate these things, but they were only allowed one listen. Here they were allowed, you know, 15 or 20 minutes to listen to these passages and carefully rate them. Um, and we examined correlations of these ratings to comprehensibility and intelligibility ranks. So what I'm going to show you on the next slide is just the speakers ordered by how intelligible they are, how comprehensible they are, and their scores on these sorts of things for the content faculty and the instructors, and then for the instructors versus the paid raters or expert raters. 
I don't want you to take too much from this kind of unpacking it. You can look and see that in fact for content faculty and ESL faculty, a lot of these numbers are pretty similar. You see people showing up in the same sorts of places for uh, within these kind of broader columns. You don't see the same thing to be true across these columns, right? Uh, so intelligibility in particular diverges from comprehensibility and the ratings of these linguistic factors. This is sort of interesting because it suggests that the factors that make speech intelligible might not be the same sorts of things that we're thinking make speech understandable, right? Julia. So did you, um, how did you derive one measure for the seven language features? For these over here? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we looked at a bunch of different measures across, so we looked at the correlations across a bunch of different measures, and then we had a sort of like average score, right? I think I can't remember exactly what we did. It was a while since I did. Yeah. Um, what I think is sort of interesting is that the people who spent a long time on this didn't uh, differ a whole bunch from the people who did a kind of quick and dirty analysis. Uh, that difference is not significant at all. And if you look at the correlation of uh, the feature scores, especially from our expert raters, in terms of how they predict the content faculty's intelligibility score and comprehensibility scores, you see that none of them predict intelligibility at all. And of the ones that predict comprehensibility, you see grammar, uh, grammatical accuracy, lexical accuracy, and fluency predicting things. I should say these three are all super highly correlated with one another. And what this suggests to me is it's really hard to find a specific feature or specific features that make non-native speech easier or harder to understand, right? Again, it's complicated. All of these things come together. There's something clearly about the lower proficiency speakers that makes them less intelligible, but it's not one of these factors. It's probably all of these factors combined with a bunch of other stuff that we don't even know how to measure yet. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so to summarize this, we see that experience matters in some circumstances, uh, but, this is what I get for writing this while I was watching baseball. <laughs> uh, comparing intelligibility and comprehensibility performance across listener groups isn't trivial. It's not simple to say it's always going to be people behaving in this way or this way. I think that's what I meant. Uh, and a number of factors influence this native, non-native communication chain. So now we're going to turn our attention to in-lab adaptation. Um, there are three studies I'm going to tell you about that look at in-lab adaptation. Uh, the question here is, can listeners improve at understanding non-native speech in the lab? If we just give them a little bit of practice, can they get better at it? Um, so I'm going to present this series of three studies. The first uh, was by Bradlow and Bent in 2008. They asked whether listeners generalized to novel speakers or novel accents after training on non-native speech. They had listeners participate in five conditions, a single Mandarin talker who was the same talker they heard at test. Right, so this test, can you get better at one person? The next is a single Mandarin talker who's different than the test talker. Is one native Mandarin speaker enough to help you get better at Mandarin speech in general, Mandarin accented speech in general? Uh, oh, I skipped native accent. This is just, do you get better at these kinds of sentences in this task, right? It's embedded in a little bit of noise, so it's a little tricky. Uh, multiple Mandarin talkers on a single accent, right? We have five Mandarin talkers, test them on a sixth one. So do you need this kind of uh, variability among talkers to get this generalization? And then an untrained group who did nothing but the test. And we tested people on a native Mandarin talker and a native Slovakian talker. Me, I didn't do this one, uh, they. Um, the training was two consecutive days, took about 30 minutes each day. They heard 16 sentences uh, five times, either five of the same talker or five different talkers, etc. They wrote down the sentences, they were presented in a little noise. I'll play this twice. so weird it plays like the very end the first time I clicked in them. I didn't have that problem this, you know what I did, I taught in this room this fall and we had this problem. The matchboxes are empty. The matchboxes are empty. That's the kind of sentences we have here. They're not semantically anomalous, they're not particularly semantically predictable either. Um, the test was the same as training but with two new lists and we scored things for keywords correct. 
So uh, what we see for our Chinese accented talker is that the untrained people are around 60% correct. And given the height of that bar and the scale, you can guess other bars are going to be higher than that. <laughs> uh, if you just practice the task, you see a huge amount of improvement, right? So just practicing these sentences with the speech and noise, you get better at understanding non-native speech. That's good news. If you practice listening to things, you get better at listening to all sorts of things. And non-native speech isn't necessarily special, right, in that way. Uh, if you practice a single talker, but are tested on a different talker, you look no different than the task control. So listening to native English speakers or listening to one native Mandarin speaker, there's no difference there. If you are tested on the same talker you've been trained on, you're great, really, really good at that task. And if we train you on multiple talkers and test you on a new talker, you're also great. Right? So we see talker-specific learning, but we also see this talker general learning. Does this general learning, after training on a Mandarin speaker or speakers, transfer to a new accent? I'm going to zip through this because the answer is no. Uh, they are not any better. This bar looks a little bit higher, but the difference is not significant. So uh, there are two follow-up questions to this. I'm going to get back to the accent general bit in a second. but. Uh, my favorite, I think my favorite study I've ever done is this one, which is, do we need to attend to speech all the time in order to adapt to it? I teach college students, and college students, you are here, so I'm saying this to your face, um, <laughs> like to put in maybe less effort if that's possible, right? So if it is possible to put in slightly less effort, you will do that. If not that you don't like to work hard, but if you can get away with working a little bit less hard, not just college students. That's, that's organisms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> organisms in general. Exactly. That's right. So what we were interested in is how does a combination of active practice and passive exposure influence adaptation, right? So we did the same paradigm as before. Our training was all multiple talkers, and I'm just going to show the Mandarin post-test here because it's the more interesting one. Uh, and we varied the task during training. So this is our basic uh, sort of protocol. Uh, we have, we actually didn't have a pretest here, I stole this from our first experiment, but in the all active condition they did the same thing they did in the previous thing, wrote down the sentences as they heard them, right? In the active and passive condition they alternated between writing down sentences and doing a different thing while they heard sentences still. In the all passive condition they didn't write down anything, they just did this distractor task while they heard the same number of sentences, same amount of time, everything. And then in the short active condition, participants heard the same amount of, did the same amount of active training as they did here in the active passive case. But during uh, the break, when the people were doing the passive task, which I'll show you in a second, um, they did the passive task, but in silence, instead of hearing sounds. So if we see that the active passive group is better than the short active group, that suggests that it can't just be attributed to the active exposures alone. It's not the case that we're just overtraining them in the all active case. It means something about those passive exposures, especially. Yeah? And uh, if learning, uh, if active passive is better than the all passive case, it can't just be something about the total number of exposures. It's something about the actual active part, right? So we're interested in is it the active part and the passive part together? Our passive task was this, uh, which is webdings. If you ever wanted a use for webdings, boy, do I have one for you. Uh, this is a key at the top, right? And your job is to translate the symbols here using this key. So you've got to write down the numbers, right? Um, there were rows and rows and rows of this. We had different keys for each block. And we ran this uh, with students who are quite competitive. And so we told them the average college student finishes one and a half rows of this during the passive case, which was a lie. Um, but it made sure that they paid attention to this task, right? Because they wanted to know how they did compared to Okay, so what I'm gonna show first is data you've already seen in a slightly different format. This is our um, task control from the previous case, right? That didn't hear a foreign accent uh, at all, but did this task. This is the all active case, right? Where they were trained on the multiple talkers and they're so much better than these guys over here. Okay, in the all passive case, they're a little bit better than the no foreign accent control, although that difference is not significant. 
And same thing is true for the short active case. What's interesting, what we care about here, is when you pay attention some of the time and don't pay attention some of the time, what does your learning look like? Awesome. <laughs> it's great. Uh, and it's this case also for uh, non-native phoneme learning. You see a similar sort of pattern emerge. So we see in this case that uh, the combination of active practice and passive exposure is just as effective as active exposure alone. It can't be attributed to the short amount of active exposure or just due to the passive exposures. It's due to some combination of these two things, yeah? Okay. Uh, indulge me for like three more minutes. We started a little late, so. Uh, okay, our last bit of evidence, we trained listeners using an identical paradigm to Bradlow and Ben 2008, and we asked whether accent general adaptation might occur if listeners were provided with a variety of accents. So we trained them on five different accents, right? Not just five different talkers, but five different accents. This is data you've seen before, just showed it to you, no foreign accent, single foreign accent. If you're trained on multiple foreign accents, these are our native Mandarin speak, uh, this is the native Mandarin speaker test. Cool, right? Native Mandarin speaker was uh, not this particular speaker, but a native Mandarin speaker was included in this test set. So this is a case where we're seeing uh, training on one talker generalized to a new talker of that accent, but only in the context of multiple accents. Now, if we look at our native Slovakian uh, speaker at test, we see generalization to the new talker and the new accent. So you get training a generalization not only to an accent included in the speaker set, also a novel accent. And all of this leads us to ask things about what are the properties that are allowing for adaptation, especially to multiple talkers of the same accent or multiple talkers of different accents. Um, one hypothesis is that non-native speech tends to differ from native speech in similar ways. I'm not talking about the variability within a speaker, but I'm talking about especially the properties of non-native speech. We know that non-native speakers of English, for example, have a lot of difficulty with reduced vowels. This is true across a wide variety of native language backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, we see similar repairs for phonotactic constraints. There are only so many things you can do if you don't like consonant clusters, and one of them is stick a vowel in the middle of it, right? So uh, these sorts of factors might influence our ability to adapt to uh, non-native speech. Uh, Becky Laternas, who's a PhD student at NYU, is working on uh, this problem a bit for her dissertation. Um, so hopefully she'll have something interesting to tell us soon. In summary, non-native speech is more difficult to understand than native speech, we know that. But what I'm trying to do here and in a lot of my work is shift the focus to the native speaker as the communicative partner and ask how do speakers improve at understanding non-native speech? What factors influence a listener's ability to understand non-native speech? Are these similar for other types of unfamiliar speech or is there something special about non-native speech that we should be considering? And I think what's emerging is a really nuanced picture with many factors, including an examination of the properties of non-native speech themselves, informing our understanding of this communicative task more broadly. Okay, that's 57 minutes. So, uh, three minutes of silence now. Uh, thank you so much for your time.